and uh, appreciate you very much. We're talking about the family and the home. And tonight we're going to talk about when problems take place within the home. Uh, There are going to be problems in your home. There are problems in every home. I want to go ahead and and, uh, strike a misnomer right out of the gate here. We're going to do as the great philosopher Barney Fife would say, let's just nip this, nip it in the bud. Problems in the home do not only occur in bad homes. Problems within the family and problems in the home take place very often in great homes. I mean, if you were to stop just from your knowledge of God's word and go back and recollect the problems that took place in the homes of God's people, we begin with the very first home, Adam and Eve. Stop and put yourself in the position of Adam and Eve. You lost not one child, you lost two children. Because not only did one of your sons, your firstborn, kill his brother, you lost one son to murder, and then you lost the second son, Cain, after he was banished for punishment for his sin. The very first family. There's no one around. There's no community to turn. There are no neighbors to console you. There's no family to help you. You are dealing with grief in losing two sons. The very first home had problems. You don't read too much longer in the book of Genesis until you come to great father Abraham. And he had some problems in his home with the whole Hagar and Ishmael situation. You go deeper into the Old Testament and the greatest king in Israel's history, David, had some great, great problems in his family. Good people can have problems in the home. And this evening, maybe I'm speaking of you. There may be some members here this evening, some visitors with us tonight, and you're experiencing problems in your family. Now, maybe you're one of the fortunate ones. Maybe you're sitting here thinking within yourself as I'm starting this lesson, and you're thinking, well, everything's great in my home. We don't have any family problems, and God bless you if that's you. But let me tell you, maybe you just haven't had a family long enough yet, or you just need to be prepared. The day is coming. It happens in every home. Godly people can have problems in their homes. I'd like for you to turn with me to Luke chapter number 15. I'm not sure if my lesson is uh, loaded on PowerPoint yet or not. Um, well, it always did now. Well, listen, that, that could be the case, right? All right, so. User error is very likely. I'm going to say that's me. Is it turned up like, okay, yeah, yeah, yep, it's me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Luke chapter 15 is where we are going to spend our evening this evening. This is a very familiar text uh, to most of us, if not all of us. This is a parable that does not shed light on why problems come about, but it does offer a beautiful pattern for what to do when problems occur. 
There are three parables in Luke chapter 15. Uh, The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. Or sometimes we refer to it as the parable of the prodigal son. It's this latter parable we want to look at tonight, and it's this latter parable that um, may be the most special to us. Uh, Some writer has said that speaking of this parable, our text tonight, it is the parable by our Lord that offers more human empathy than any other parable he spoke. And it's true, it is dripping with love. And that's why we want to spend our time in this text. Now let me be the responsible teacher this evening as the Lord would require of me, James chapter 3, and let you know that as we are going to deal with this parable tonight, We're not dealing with, per se, what the parable teaches. That would be bad hermeneutics in preacher language. We are going, rather, to make an application from this parable. We want to look at what Jesus teaches about this parable and draw from it an application that we are able to use that can fit our problems in the home, rebelliousness in particular. The parable is dealing with the rebellious child. We may apply it to any other family member. Maybe you are dealing with a rebellious spouse, a husband or wife who left the Lord and is no longer faithful. Possibly you as an adult child are dealing with a rebellious parent, a parent who was once a member of the Lord's church and has since left the Lord and left the church. Or maybe you're one of the parents in this assembly and you're grieving because your child left home and left the Lord as well, just as we see in this account. Whenever there is difficulties in the home, whenever there is rebellion in the home, whenever a family member fails us, there are three stages we are able to see from this text that can get us through these dark days. Let's notice these together with me. Number one, we want to begin with stage one, rebellion. Stage number one, rebellion. Notice with me, we'll read together verses 11 through 16. He said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with, I'm reading from the New King James Version, prodigal living, hence the prodigal son. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. Stage one, rebellion. Now as soon as a home is created, as soon as a family comes together, there is the propensity to be a power struggle. There may very well be a power struggle from the beginning with a husband and a wife. There may be the opportunity for the wife to engage in a power control with her husband if she's not willing to do what the Bible says and allow her husband to be the head 
of the home, Ephesians chapter 5, 23 through 26. So there may be some power struggle between a husband and wife. But then we bring children into the home, and there's going to be a power struggle with children. The day will come when children will test our limits. Children will test the boundaries. Children will see how far can I go? How far can I get away with the things that my parents have stated, the boundaries that they have laid for me, there may be a power struggle in your home. And there certainly is here. Children very often want that power before they are ready to earn it. Now that's what took place here. We're not given details. We are only told by our Lord that the younger son came in and said, Father, give me the portion that is due me. Now, if we are familiar with the laws of Jewish inheritance, if we were to go back and study that under the old law, we would learn that in this particular Jewish system, as the law stated, the older son, we read of him later in the parable, the older son gets two portions and the younger son gets one. Three portions would be divided from the father. The oldest gets two out of the three. Maybe you're aware of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob was the younger, Esau was the older, but for just some pottage of stew, he was able to get Esau to sell him his birthright. That is, give him the greater portion of the inheritance. And so now, what the younger son does is he comes in and he says, Dad... I do not want to wait until you die. I want my inheritance now. And you may have heard preachers say, and I I do not think that there is anything wrong with this. I do not think it is reading into the text. I think it is exactly what God is stating unto us by the way of situation. It is the younger son coming into his father and essentially saying, I wish you were dead. You are dead to me now. I do not want to live here any longer. I do not want to be considered your son. I do not want to be under your authority. I am want to be on my own. I want to do things my way. And I want what you, what you owe me upon your death, but I want it now. It is as if I wish you were dead. That's the rebellion. Sometimes rebellion happens between husbands and wives as well. If you are a Christian, you have no right to rebel. There is no place in the life of a child of God for rebellion. There is no place in the heart of a Christian that says, I want to do what I want to do. We talked about the respect for authority even last night. The problem is you don't have that right. Verse 13 we note that as the father gave him the portion, you see that he went into a far country. A far country. Again, the text does not indicate which country. The text does not indicate how far is a far country. But we are able, we are able to assimilate that he wanted to get as far away from mom and dad as he could. Far away. His rebellion was so strong, 
He wanted to be out of sight, completely free from his father's influence and control. And so he, he did. He left with all he had and wasted what was given to him with New King James says prodigal living. King James uses the term riotous living, the meaning of which means wasteful living. He blew it. It doesn't tell us how long. It could have been days, but church, it could have been years. We don't know. What we do know is that at one point he had his inheritance and at another undisclosed time he had nothing. Nothing. As one writer said, he left for the sunset strip of Jerusalem cruising down the boulevard in his <clears throat> camelack. <clears throat> Now, what do you do? What do you do when a family member leaves? What do you do when a family member rebels? What do you do when a son or a daughter leaves home and leaves the church? When a spouse quits and leaves and rebels? Now, keep in mind, this is, I do not believe this is talking about a teenage son. The younger son does not necessarily imply that this is an adolescent youth. There are different circumstances when we're dealing with children of that age. I'm reminded years and years and years ago of, of hearing of situations where uh, teenagers, young teenagers, would, would want to rebel and they march into their mother and father's living room, and they said, I'm leaving. I'm moving out. And, and I've heard on a number of occasions that one excellent way of, of dealing with that difficult stage is for the parent to very calmly, with love, initially agree and say, okay, let me help you. And the parent would go up into the room and, and get the suitcase and begin helping the child pack, but all along talking to the child through the process. And as the parent begins talking about where are you going to stay, where are you going to live, what are you going to do on your own, that young teenager will then begin to waken and realize that moving out is not exactly what he or she really wanted to do. And I've heard of some remarkable results that turn around from that. That's not this situation. Uh, not this situation. We're dealing with adults. So now, you see on the screen, what do we do when this occurs? I've listed three things that we must remember. Number one, we let them go. We must let them go. Look at the wonderful example of the father. The father does not beg. The father is not groveling at the feet of the younger son. The father allows the child to go. He doesn't chase him down. We talked about Sunday. This is the responsibility we have as parents. It is our responsibility to prepare our children for when they are to leave. We take them from parent-controlled to self-controlled. The day is coming when they will be leaving, and we have to let them go. Consider with me the damage we have seen among families, even in the Lord's church. 
of mothers and fathers who are not willing to let their children go when they leave home. Do we not remember one of the basic tenets of the home as God laid out for us in Genesis chapter 2? Verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Before the cleaving, there must be the leaving. And it's tragic when mothers and fathers cannot cut the apron strings and will not let them go. How many parents have ruined the marriages of their children because they would not let them go? Parents, you have to let them go. And the father does exactly that. Now, in this case, a case of rebellion, God understands, and we need to understand, that in this particular situation, the tighter we try to hold on to them, the more rebellious they will become. Step one. You have to let them go. Step two, we allow them to make their own mistakes. We have to allow them to make their own mistakes. We see what transpires, verse 13, when the younger son goes off into a far country and he blows it all. Don't you know that the father knew that was going to happen? Mom and dad, no. Listen, teenager, your parents are not idiots. They know. They are smarter than you realize. That father knew what was going to happen. And although they know that we may be ruining our lives when we rebel and leave, the father understands Sometimes, for some people, the only way one may learn their lesson is through pain. Some lessons are only learned through pain. And so the father here allows the son to make his own mistakes. That's why our father in heaven does not stop us when we rebel against him. He does not intervene. Whoa, 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 whoa. And stop us before we fall into temptation. No. Our Father allows us to make our own mistakes because of what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 20 and verse 30. Blows that wound, cleanse away evil. Strokes make clean the innermost parts. In other words, sometimes it takes painful situations to make us realize our mistakes and cause us to change our ways. Number two, we allow them to make their own mistakes. And number three, we allow them to reap the consequences. We must allow them to reap the consequences of their own actions. Now you know, if the father had any insight whatsoever to be able to see the consequences of his son's actions, to find him, verses 14 through 16, now in a pigsty feeding swine and hungry, so hungry, he would have eaten the pig slop. Now that's how you say it and defeat it. Pig slop. Matter of fact, you'll like this, Tim. Defeated is known as Hogtown. 
that is the moniker. Years ago, we had a lot of pig farms in Defeated. And so the residents who've lived there their whole life, we'll call it Hogtown. He's in a pigsty. And he's so hungry, he would eat the slop. He's feeding the pigs. Now, if the father could see his son in this situation, you know how he would respond. It would break his heart. Heart. But he allows the son to reap the consequences. For a Jew, it does not get any worse. For a Jewish boy, a Jewish man, this is as bad as our Lord could describe it. It is the most humiliating, the most demeaning that the human language, the Hebrew language, could describe. Now, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And we have to understand as well, parents, listen to me. We're not the only influences in the life of our children. We're not the only influences. We have to trust in the fact that there are others who may influence them positively. God is a perfect parent. We rebel against him more often than we care to admit. God lets us leave. God allows us to make our own mistakes. And most importantly, God allows us to reap the consequences of our actions. Do you not find that interesting as we connect this to this situation? That even though there are times in our life when we praise and thank God for the forgiveness he gives us, When we repent, that sometimes there are still long-lasting consequences to our actions he will not remove. They will serve as a reminder to us of the mistake that we made. God does not remove the consequences of our actions, and we allow our family member, to reap the consequences. I had a cousin in my childhood. He was a few years older than me. He was a, he was a rebellious individual, got caught up in drugs, would leave home for days at a time. And my aunt and uncle would bring him back every time. Every time. He never learned his lesson He fell right back into it again. He was well into his adult years. And only today am I able to say that I think he's finally out of the spiral of destructive behavior that that plagued him for decades. But every time the parents came in rescuing him, saving him, not allowing him to reap the consequences, it did not help at all. It's not going to help. Number one, the stage rebellion. Number two, notice with me the second stage. It's reevaluation. Reevaluation. Verses 17 through 19. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, may I say that this stage of reevaluation would have never taken place 
Had the father not allowed the son to leave? Had the father not allowed the son to make his own mistakes and not allowed the son to reap the consequences of his actions? But because the father did allow these things from stage one and responded in the appropriate way, only now do we see the hope in his reevaluation. His attitude changed. You see that beautiful change when he says to himself, Father, give me, verse 12, now to Father, make me. Give me the portion that you owe me to now, Father, make me a servant as our young people very often beautifully sing the devotional song, make me one of your servants. His attitude changed from arrogance to submission. His attitude changed to repentance and resolution. He is now turning himself around. He's changing his heart. He's understanding the burden of sin and wants to make things right. Maybe you have uh, seen this situation. You've been in this type of a situation. You understand what this young man is experiencing. What do we do in this stage? Well, you see on the screen, there are three things we can do. Number one, we pray. Oh, we pray. We need people who will pray for us. We need people when we are rebelling, rebelling, we need people interceding on our behalf. And if you have a son or a daughter, if you have a husband or a wife, if you have a beloved family member who's left the Lord, pray. Don't ever stop praying. Oh, how praying rests the weary. Prayer will change the night today. And so, when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. We pray. Number two, we commit the situation to God. We commit the situation to God. It is out of our control. It has been out of our control. What do we do when things are out of our control? Any counselor worth his or her grain of salt will be able to share with you. When things are out of your control, there's only one thing you can do. You commit it to God. Commit it to God. Did not Peter write for our benefit, casting all your cares on him, for he careth for you? We commit the situation to God. And number three, we wait patiently. Oh, I'm not saying it's easy. Patience is that virtue which is a challenge for many, if not most of us. But this is what we do. We wait. And we wait patiently. And we learn what God has been trying to communicate to his people through his word for many years. And he wants us to wait on him. We live by his timetable, not our own. We are so impatient of a people. We need to learn to wait patiently. So what do we do in this stage? We pray. We commit the situation to God. And we wait patiently. Finally, number three, there is the return. The return stage. And how we handle this stage is vitally critical, brother and sister. It's vitally critical. There are three things we need to do. As we see from the text, 
when a rebellious child or family member comes back. Let's begin reading in verse 20 and read through verse 24. He arose, the son, came to his father, but, but, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son, but... But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Look at how the father responded. May it serve as a beautiful pattern for what we are to do should our loved one return. Number one, we love them faithfully. We love them faithfully. Verse 20 describes for us the father who sees the son afar off and does not wait for the child to make the walk of shame back to the door of of the house. He ran to meet him as if he had been looking for him day after day after day. He ran. There's no sternness from the father. The father no sooner saw his son Then he rushed with compassion to meet him. Love, true love, does not wait when it recognizes its purpose. We love them faithfully. Number two, we accept them unconditionally. We accept them unconditionally. Verse 20 says that he saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. There is that unconditional love. But then the son says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father says... Do you not notice notice that the son had already planned this little speech and the father cut him off mid-sentence, would not allow him to even finish? Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, but listen carefully. Acceptance and approval are two different things. They're two different things. The father does not approve of what the son has done. The father is not sharing approval. The father is giving acceptance. And let's be honest. Let's be real. We understand from this particular parable that the Father represents our Father in heaven who is perfect and does no wrong. But if we were to apply this to our situation, may we be able to say there are no perfect parents. I am not a perfect father. I am not a perfect husband. I am not a perfect person. So the truth of the matter is, In reality, there very likely needs to be some mutual confession. In reality, it would be now when we would probably say, I also need to confess and say, I didn't handle things perfectly myself, and I'm sorry also. That's the reality of the situation, but we accept them unconditionally. And then number three, we forgive them completely. 
Notice what the Father does. Verse 22, bring out the best robe. Put a ring on his hand. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and let's rejoice. There is no reservation on the part of the Father. Listen carefully to me, please, brother and sister. There is no probation period by the Father stated. There is complete unadulterated forgiveness. Do you doubt the logic in that? Let's reverse that then, please. When you rebel against God and sin against Him, does He waive reprobation before you? I'll forgive you. I repent, Father. Okay, okay, okay. But I'm going to put you over here in this little probation area and you're going to have to prove six months that you really do mean what you say. Is that how God treats us? What did our Lord tell Peter when Peter asked about forgiveness? How oft shall a man sin and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus said, if he comes to you and repents, you forgive him 70 times seven in a day. There is complete forgiveness. Has that been lacking in the Lord's church these days? God does not rub things in. He rubs things out. That's what forgiveness is. And it's not at this time that people need sermons The prodigal son knows he had done wrong. He does not need to be preached at. Don't preach a sermon. Don't remind him of his error. Don't tell her where she's been wrong. Hug her. Hug him. The father interrupted the confession and forgave completely. Oh, you know as well as I, the hero in this story is not the son. The hero is the father. It shows us how God deals with us when we rebel. And he thus, by his example, godliness, is teaching us how to be godly in our forgiveness of others when family members fail us. Stage one, rebellion. Stage two, reevaluation. Stage three, the return. Now, for this young man, there is a happily ever after. And for you, you may still be waiting. I understand that. For many, they've been waiting and they've been waiting a long time. The hope that I may offer you this evening is in the fact that the ball game is not over with yet. The bottom of the ninth is not here just yet. There's still time. Do not put up your cleats just yet. Don't do it. Some of you may have broken hearts because your family members have failed you and you have been questioning God, why? Why have you allowed so-and-so to do this? Why is this happening to me, to my husband or wife? Why is this happening to us? The thing that you need to do is turn your hurt over to God. Turn your hurt over to God. 
Maybe you're one in the audience. Maybe you've been playing with rebellion. Maybe you've been teeter-tottering with this rebellious attitude. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. I can't wait till I get out from underneath mom and dad so I can do what I want to do. Listen, life is not that way. Let's say that uh, we're in a, a, a rubber lifeboat and we're all out in the middle of the Pacific. We're in this lifeboat and you are sitting there with a large knife. And you say and you announce to all of us as we're in the lifeboat with you that you're about to go and you're fixing to puncture and put a big old hole in that boat. And we we question. We try to stop you. And you say, hey, it's my knife. This is my seat. I can do whatever I want to do. I can live my life the way I want to live. And you will soon realize that your actions do not just affect you, they affect all of us. You puncture a hole in that lifeboat, we're all going down. That's how life works. We all affect others. We affect our family. We cannot just do whatever we want. All sin is against God. The parable teaches us that when the prodigal came to himself, came and realized, worked up his confession, and then said to his father, I have sinned not just before thee with what I have All sin we commit is against God. First and foremost, tonight, where do you find yourself? Where is your life? Have you been rebellious against God? Maybe you haven't left the church. Maybe you haven't left a family member. But maybe you have been rebellious. Maybe you've been committing sin, breaking the heart of God. And God's allowing you to make your own mistakes, to reap your own consequences, please come back. Please do what's right. And if there is one tonight who needs to obey the gospel, this is a wonderful occasion for you to put Christ on in baptism, to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, to be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. If you need to become a child of God, or if you need to make things eternally right, won't you let us help you? As together we stand and as we sing.